<laughs> World coming in the journal of unusual principles. Mm. So, so, Diego, I yeah. really pleased you are here, mm. but I don't know much about you. So, uh, if right. you can present yourself, I can give a little bit of an introduction. So, uh, my name is Diego Calero. I'm a um, biological anthropologist in training and a philosopher by formation. Uh, I've studied psychology, philosophy, and biological anthropology, um, and my main lines of interest are within different fields of knowledge, the things that are most connected to minds or to evolution. And I've also participated in the creation of the effective altruism movement uh, in its early conception. And I'm a nomadic traveler in Europe, as of right now, in Bulgaria. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> so that's basically my story and how I got here. Hmm. Yeah, that's super cool. Uh, when I met you online, I was really fascinated how you could connect all of these different disciplines and all of this through the prism of evolutionary psychology. And uh, what I really liked about you is that you can actually solve current social problems, so propose possible solutions which are based on evolutionary psychological thinking. And in that sense, evolutionary psychology can be used as a predictive theory. Find right. possible solutions. Can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, I mean, to a great extent, there's been there's a combination of ignorance and a little bit of suppression mm -hmm. in terms of um, how we deal with evolutionary psychology because we just don't. Most people don't have a complete model of how our cognition was sculpted by evolution and because they do not have that, uh, there's a lot of political solutions or social solutions or sociology solutions that basically slip through your fingers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, people throw the baby with the bathwater because they assume things about human nature that are not necessarily true. So I think you actually need to have a lens that uses evolutionary science and evolutionary psychology uh, in order to even begin to understand how to tackle any particular problem that you're dealing with. Um, and yeah. So. yeah, and except uh, for revolutionary psychology, do you happen to know any other theory which um, comes close in well, explaining human behavior in a predictive way? I mean, to the extent that, if you mean, uh, that comes close in ability to talk to particular people and how to organize your life around it, I don't think so. I think evolutionary psychology is the most pragmatically useful science that I'm aware of. Um, you can get good insight from you know, philosophy, from evolution, from uh, anthropology and other things, but uh, it really helps in navigating the human social space and, mm. and the world, uh, especially when it comes to things like courtship and society design, which are two things that humans are essentially and forever very interested and curious about. <laughs> Right? People always want to change their society and mm. people always want to find a mate and, yeah. Um, yeah, and be with them. So. And how society design changes through the years? I mean, um, is the change in certain societies exponentially growing in speed, like how often it changes? Or is there a pattern or something like that? Well, one of the biggest prediction factors that you can take from evolutionary anthropology to think about that is technology has connected people who are at farther and farther distances over time. So it means that we are dealing with minds that have evolved in systems and organizations that are like less and less like our own. Uh, so one thing that a lot of people have been studying recently is pathological altruism, uh, mm. which is the case where like altruism sort of backfires, that is your generosity or your kindness towards strangers backfires, uh, because the reason why you evolved to be altruistic to begin with uh, is because the people nearby you have evolved in a system of high trust or because they share genes with you or a combination thereof, right? Mm. Uh, but then when you manifest the same level of altruism and understanding and empathy and so on towards people who are farther away, it, it doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the the good that could come out of that originally. So that's one example where, you know, the technology, the exponential technological development generated a geographical crushing of boundaries, mm -hmm. uh, and then the psychological adaptation you had, which mm -hmm. was very useful for your biogeography, no longer functions. That's remind me for the m migration people with 
especially in Europe. Right yeah. now there is migration crisis. Yeah. So maybe, maybe there we have something like that. That's the clash of uh, cultural difference. And one thing I notice a lot in the Europeans that I talk to, even in the strip, mm -hmm. right, especially people who aren't you know, in science or particularly interested in these topics, mm -hmm. uh, is, is precisely that, right? Where I get much more predictive information about what a person will think about immigration, about people who are coming in, mm -hmm. from knowing where they are from and where they evolved and what their mm -hmm. society is like than I get from the information about like who are the people coming in or something like that, right? Hmm. So like my Swiss friend, Swiss, Switzerland being a very high trust, um, high, uh, yeah, high, high level of trust society and a very like organized old society, uh, he basically trusts everyone uh, hmm. who to, to come and all of his perspectives are kind of infused with this idea that everyone is trustworthy, that there is like a, an easy path to transforming a person of one kind and of one uh, of one like system of organization into a person of a different kind, mm. and he's not concerned about that at all. Same thing for Norway, right? Um, but as you approach, I suppose, as you get closer and closer to the places from where people are immigrating, um, you get a, a more differentiated sense mm. because different countries have these different levels of trust. I think uh, Bulgaria, where we are, is one of the inverse trust countries. Mm where people in, in common goods games, they are willing to pay to punish someone who actually cooperated with the common goods mm. that will grow, which is kind of the reverse of what happens in Norway. What's the evolutionary adaptation of that? It's, it's actually not well determined. So, so Sapolsky, uh, who's an mm. American, yeah, American uh, biogenomic psychologist, a very a mix of behavioral genomics. The zebra guy. Yeah, the, the zebra, zebra guy, yeah, the, ze the, the also a zebra guys. Mm -hmm. uh, he basically says, like, we don't really know exactly what's going on there, mm -hmm. but one can speculate, right? So, like, there, there's a transition from more clannish individualistic societies to more, uh, no, from more clannish uh, family nepotistic societies to more individualistic institution-based societies. And that transition in Europe, it, it is very manifest, right? So there's a there's a few regions in Europe, basically, uh, that through influence of the Catholic Church, among other things, they 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 evolved higher levels of individualism and higher levels of institutionalism. And then as you as you back away from that, uh, you you have societies where people don't like if you start creating a more individualistic, more institution-based system, mm -hmm. which is how a, a high trust system works. Yeah, it's not, it's not very obvious why, why you would want to punish someone who is contributing to the common goods, except if you, if you have a gift economy, for instance, and you expect that that person isn't just providing the resource itself, but they're just trying to signal that they're better than you. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to like cut them from the ability of, of, of signaling, look, you can't pay back this, you know, like I'm giving you a gift so good, you can't really pay back. Mm -hmm. um, and in some gift societies that does happen. There's also many African societies that do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Regarding pathological altruism, uh, let me wrap it up so that I know that I understood you. So um, your psychological systems for altruism evolved to so when you help you either expect uh, help in return as a re in the future or you expect uh, that when you help you are helping at least partially some of your genes which are in another body so to speak and now when you help strangers or genetically people who aren't genetically related to you you aren't helping your genes and uh, maybe you can't get anything in return if they are like at the other end of the world, something like that. That would be a more biological version of, of the concept of pathological altruism, but I don't think that that's how most people who are thinking about it in sociology <coughs> think of it. So yeah, you can think of kin selection and the fact that you know in our current societies, because there's diversity of populations, when you contribute to someone, they, they are less likely to share your genes, right? Uh, and that might be, in a sense, a problem. But what people mostly mean by pathological altruism is when you were considering being altruistic for evolutionary reasons because you evolved with other people who will also be altruistic mm -hmm. but now you're dealing with people who are more likely to cheat uh -huh. or who are more likely so it's mm -hmm. not 
it's not that much about whether they share genes with you or not. It's about whether they will manifest the same behavior mm. when, you know, like the problem, when the short stick is in your hand and the long stick is in their hand, will they mm. give it, will they, will they help you the same way you help them? And uh, that's basically the reasoning behind the people who think about pathological altruism. So I would say it's a game theory concept more than it's a biology concept. Mm. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Can you think of uh, or list some drawbacks of evolutionary psychology? I mean, drawbacks of knowing it or drawbacks of the science having existed? Uh, Actually, both when you're asking like that. <laughs> okay. I mean, the science itself got a lot of hits and it's really hard for an evolutionary psychologist to, uh, evolutionary psychologist to establish themselves in other departments mm -hmm. because, you know, if you go talk to the people in neuroscience or something like that, they'll be like, look, we don't want the social justice warriors and the people who will attack us to come attack us, so please, like, leave your field, which is too dramatic and too close yeah, to we don't, uh, we don't want a podcast with you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so, in part, evolutionary psychology was actually created, well, okay, maybe not, not in the 70s when it was created, but in the last 10, 15 years, it's sort of a refuge, right? It's a refuge where it's so well known that the material that's going to come in there, it's not going to be that appreciated by the sociologists, by mm. the anthropologists, and uh, you know, by the art critics and literary critics, <laughs> that uh, it's okay. But there needed to be this separate realm um, where those ideas can be studied, because if they're if they are added to biology, if they're added to neuroscience, if they're added to other fields, uh, especially in the United States, it gets really, um, yeah, it gets really mad really fast, um, just because of the political contentions between different personalities and fields and people. And regarding some weak points of evolutionary psychology, as uh, a theory, as a methodology, so, well, I mean, like, what kinds of mistakes we're most likely to make, or, or yeah. For example, yes. Yeah, I mean, I side effects. Yeah, there, there's a lot of criticism that uh, that happens in many media. Like the way in which evolutionary psychology is depicted in many media is very problematic mm -hmm. uh, because um, much like anything else, people go for whatever the most sensationalist uh, version of a, of a theory is. There's a, a very good evolutionary psychology called David Smith, a professor, I don't remember where now, but he has an article, you know, 10... ten Ten or eight big mistakes uh, that people make when thinking about evolutionary psychology, mm -hmm. and then you can use that as a filter, sort of, to to organize how you read through when the media is talking about it. Um, but one of the classic complaints is that it it isn't predictive or it doesn't make, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have an obvious experimental data, and it's it's a bunch of just so stories. Um, and then he also has a reply article to that saying, look, here are the eight different sort epistemic, uh, epistemological sources of information that evolutionary psychologists gather in order to, assess, to generate their theories. It's not just, just, just soul stories. Um, yeah, um, so there's a good defense of that. Can be used evolutionary psychology to predict some of the, hmm, how to say it, future moves of, let's say, or behaviors of, on macro level, of countries or nationalities or something like that? Well, you can anticipate what the clash between different populations will be if you put those populations together to mm -hmm. some extent, right? So one thing that is true of all humans is that we trust people who are like us more than we trust people who are less like us. So this is actually one of the big things that's happening, you know, in, in political contentions in, in, in many places now, uh, you can use it to predict how these populations will interact. Or maybe um, like uh, alliances, how may combine, let's say, or something. Are you asking if it could be used to justify alliances between like populations that are similar? Uh, I mean, more like, uh, let's say I'm United States as a country, right. and I would like to have a, a trade alliance. Should I use evolutionary psychology for my decision making? Uh, or with who should yeah. I be in alliance or something like that? Well, 
I mean, we're talking about a very specific subset, so, so maybe I should mention that. Like, we're talking about a specific subset of evolutionary psychology, mm -hmm. which is the evolutionary psychology of populations mm -hmm. in relation to other populations, uh, whereas most of evolutionary psychology is just about things that we all share as humans, right? So, you know, baby taking behavior of taking care of babies, nourishing behavior, uh, mating, uh, organizing yourself in, in specific ways in relation to the environment. Uh, but if you're talking about these specific differences, that, that that's what's going to pop up, let's say, in, in political discussion, you can actually predict the types of governments that a population will have based off a combination of its biogeography mm -hmm. and uh, the evolved characteristics of that population. So if you knew that, it will help you determine, for instance, if you should uh, try to attack a population in the Middle East and change their government from a more authoritarian system to a less authoritarian system. Like, maybe not, because that population mm -hmm. evolved in a scarcity environment, uh, in deserts where honor cultures evolve, and uh, where, you know, where all those factors take place, you're not to expect uh, to establish a Western educated democracy and so on. Um, have you, I, I presume you know about cybernetics. I know some about cybernetics. I've read some, some amount about it. Yeah. Uh, so, it's the science of steering, steering uh, biological entities and machines. Right. Uh, so many people think of cybernetics for like cyborgs or something like that, but right. uh, the cool stuff. it's way, way before right. everything yeah. like robotics. And it's um, how you could, um, let's say, <clears throat> steer the decision of, uh, let's say, group of people or uh, even to an individual or it could be even a mechanical entity. Um, let's say an AI. Right. Well, I mean, in, in engineering, uh, there's control theory, which is fairly connected to, to cybernetics. And systems that are cybernetic have basically mechanisms that reorganize them and redirect them back into a specific mm -hmm. direction. Um, biological systems might have similar things, right? So if you increase the food supply in a determined region, you're going to get more reproduction. But up to a point where you know the resources uh, and the reproduction are pattern matched again, and then you you get a loss loss in population, yeah. right? So biological systems definitely do have cybernetic properties, but not necessarily. You can use that kind of thing to reason about uh, evolutionary psychology, or or more specifically like population dynamics and uh, competitive evolution of different populations. Mm. Uh, in fact, the one of my advisors asked like this precise question he was asking me about whether cybernetics is valuable or not mm -hmm. in order to um, in order to assess one of my papers which is about the value of Christianity like thinking about Christianity as a super organism and thinking about other religions mm -hmm. as a super organism so to that extent our religions like a beehive like an ant hill you know like groups of insects that are a biological unit even though they're a group uh, and he sort of contested my claim that it's possible that you can evaluate religions that way, that you can evaluate these groups that way, uh, by saying, look, you can, you can also think about these things cybernetically as continuous entities that are always mutually influencing each other. Mm -hmm. But evolution doesn't work like that because evolution um, organizes itself around discrete units. Mm -hmm. So you need discrete units like the genes in order to get the cumulatory mutations that eventually constitute a big difference, right? So you can only create a difference if the differences from which you're composing your larger difference are also discrete units. So if you mean cybernetics as a, the science of the continuous interference between different systems on each other, then no, cybernetics can't be used to think about evolutionary psychology, but, it's, but I don't know if that's what he meant, that's what this particular advisor meant when he asked me the, that question. Yeah, and another thought is like, <laughs> If, uh, let's say, Christianity is a tool that is used by someone who implies cybernetics to control an, a group or entities, this right. is like another approach, but uh, maybe then we're getting more in uh, 
Yeah. Well, there's a question of whether the control is coming from the top, from the top bottom, or from a combination thereof, right? Yeah, yeah. So I tend to lean on the direction that it's mm -hmm. it's a combination thereof, and there are definitely mm -hmm. emerging properties in religions and in cultures and in nations mm -hmm. uh, that um, make that group be sort of like a biological unit, mm -hmm. uh, in the same sense that you know a group of ants that lives in the same hill is a is a mm -hmm. biological unit in a significant manner. And that's basically the thing that I'm examining right now. Um, me and a few other uh, evolutionary anthropologists and biologists and so on, we're trying to basically dissolve a bit of the of something that I defended most of my life, but that was probably wrong, um, which is this new atheist flaw, like perspective that uh, religion is mostly a virus in the mind um, instead of being a, a symbiont or a mutualist combination of... Um, cultural ideas and, and physical buildings and rituals and so on that actually helps you organize and structure a biological unit that evolves over time. Yeah, and uh, did it play a role in um, organizing the behavior of um, vastly different tribes? You know, we yesterday we discussed the many psychological, cultural, and biological and immunological reasons why different uh, groups hate each other you know, from our evolutionary <laughs> past. Right. And did religion play a role in like helping vastly different tribes work together? Well, if you think about the evolution of monotheism, uh, this, is, this actually happened at a very uh, visible symbolic level, right? So you had different, uh, different tribes and different organizations, sometimes mm -hmm. polytheist, sometimes like beginning to be monotheist, uh, but they all had different gods and different mythologies. What happened in the evolution of uh, monotheism, and Joe Henrich is a Harvard professor that studies this, is as the society scaled, these gods were merged into each other in a somewhat cybernetic symbiotic process, and uh, we, we eventually landed into a biological group that had this one god idea, right? So the Abrahamic religions, uh, they are very effective at monitoring and organizing the, the behavior of a society in scale. Um, it's very, it, it's, you can get a society running if it's a small society with many gods. But once it gets sufficiently large, especially if you're in a desert area and you have, only have the sun as a natural feature, um, one god is a more effective way of organizing behavior and of preventing, you know, misdemeanors, crimes, and other other ways in which people could behave that are damaging to the group or damaging to themselves. Hmm. I should ask, how did this evolutionary psychological knowledge impact your life in practical terms? Could, could I just ask a question before that, because we're going to go to another direction? Yes. Yeah. Uh, having, having one entity, let's, let, let's say a god, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, for your perspective, it's more efficient, I guess. Could, could we say that? Is well, it, yeah, it, it can organize a society that is larger yeah. in scale, right? Yeah, and this and is... And people are more afraid if the god is more powerful as well. And <laughs> right now we have this, uh, even in... Um, it's, it's, it's like a t technical problem. Even in, uh, let's say, right now, the cryptocurrency community face the same thing and that is like if you have to um, if you have one entity to validate let's say transactions it's really right. fast if you have multiple entities to validate a transaction it's slow everyone should right. validate and, and we have the same problem in democracy so right so basically you're seeing there what you're seeing there is the cost of scale yeah. Right. The thing these yeah. all these things have in common is it's really costly to run a society of humans. It's costly to run a, a system of smart contracts, and it's costly to run. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And 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 the there's a constant battle, let's say, between the centralizers and the decentralizers. So you can think of that as you know the centralizers in government. When you think about politics and government, centralizers are usually like the the more communist left leaning side, and the decentralizers are more capitalistic and so on. Um, in technology, the decentralizing systems are 
you know, smart contracts, uh, cryptocurrencies in general, Peer-to-peer. and the more centralizing you are, like the people who are dealing with artificial general intelligence mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and AI, right? So China is very big on AI, so you see that the political and the and the technological are matching there, where you know both of those are centralizing systems. China is a very centralized government. For for me, the next revolution and religion is monotheism and polytheism. Yeah, and, and for me, the, the next revolution, um, the next evolution of humankind is going to to achieve a de- decentralized structure that is more efficient than centralized. And I haven't seen that. So you mean in in the social and economic realms? Everything. Uh, I mean, if, because not if, necessarily if, there's an equivalent in biology there, right? So it, this is not going to happen to genes. This is happening to our monetary yeah, system I, or something like that. I mean, yeah. But if we find it in one structure, uh, even in uh, technical terms, because mm-hmm. let's say I, I, I'm doing a lot of programming, and if you if you have to validate data, it, it doesn't come even uh, to uh, cryptocurrency in this relation is quite older problem on how you spread data and validate data. Right. If we, let's say, um, in technical term, find a solution, we can apply that in societies, uh, in, if, I think cu- culture will, will change our self culture in large scale. Well, and it, that, it, it could definitely change culture and in general, in the last few years, right, ever since Brexit, mm. our culture is already transitioning to a more decentralized nationalistic state, right? Like with Bitcoin uh, mm. and all the election of the nationalist presidents everywhere and people being leaning more right wing. Mm. Um, it seems that social media and the internet have had a massive effect on increasing the power of individuals and families and, tri- and uh, tribal affiliation and nations. Uh, and decreasing the power of centralized media control uh, and what people call like globalists uh, or you know uh, internationalist <coughs> groups and systems that usually are the same uh, personality types that organize and and uh, circumscribe like media media sources mm-hmm. in most places mm-hmm. yeah uh, and that used to have a lot more control of governments mm-hmm. you know until a few years ago. So we are definitely seeing a movement towards decentralization in, in politics in the world and it's mimicked in a way by the decentralization in cryptocurrencies and other mm-hmm. smart contract systems. Um, do you think that this is uh, in some way related uh, that in psychology terms, let's say in the 80s, more people started to believe that they are unique and more like marketing was used to um, propose that you are a unique person, you are the individual and so Like on. a snowflake theory? You achieve something. everything, you know, you believe in yourself. Well, individualism is actually an enemy of centralization. Uh, so mm. to the extent that, you know, Christianity in a sense is an instantiator of individualism, the United States and the United States Constitution are instantiators of individualism. There are countries that are fairly, fairly individualistic. Uh, and that's sort of in the opposite direction, right? Individualism is the maximum level of decentralization you can possibly have. Um, that said, you know, making everyone believe they're a special snowflake and absolutely unique in some magical way, mm-hmm. and that they are uh, they are owed more than they deserve or something like that, uh, that might be closer to something that is favorable to a more uh, internationalist, globalist uh value system and agenda Mm -hmm. but the reason is because then you these people who believe that they are uh, somehow deserving of more because of their particular um, because of their particular way they first they will start identifying with a particular group and then by identifying with a group uh, you you acquire all the grievances of the group Mm -hmm. and second uh, you can try to use the state as the mediator in order for you to get the things that people made you believe you need uh-huh. Right. Yeah, that that's where I was going with, let's say, propaganda and how propaganda is integrated in the corporations, how corporations use the propaganda. And Edward, uh, you know, Edward Bern- Bernays is, is how Bernay? it's Bern- Bern- no, Bernays. I don't know. Um, 
the nephew of, the nephew of Zygmunt Freud. He uses prop, mm. uh, he integrated propaganda in uh, uh, corp uh, for corporate culture for sales. Right. Uh, using and. And he lived for 104 years. You know. uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, and what I was uh, trying to say because uh, he managed to use uh, the propaganda in uh, uh, different um, time times. Uh, how how to say it? Uh, time spans where the psychology of humans was different. Mm. Let's say you have individualism. You have uh, if you identify right. by class. So if if you identify by class class, you you sell. Uh, for the luxury items, for the rich guys, and so on. You are the mid, right. in the mid, and so on. Yes. Then uh, in the eighties, you have uh, the individualism. You have to be unique, mm. and they manage to sell oh, us right. to be unique, and so on. Is this yeah. the guy that made yeah. uh, smoking cool for yeah. women? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I suppose as capitalism became more developed and the amount of production that you had uh, went higher, the, the types of goods that are worth selling changed a little bit and the marketing people might have had a big influence on that, right? So I don't know, I don't know much about what happened you know, in the 80s era and before that, but in the beginning of the 20th century, there was definitely a move from wanting to buy the thing to wanting to buy experiences, mm -hmm. and then from experiences, uh, even experiences became sufficiently available. So from experiences, there was the transition to authenticity. Uh, so you no, you, you no longer want to like have the same experience as everyone else, but you want to have the authentic uh, farm-grown coffee from the specific region of God knows where. You know, like you're you're no longer selling a toaster. Yeah, before you were mm -hmm. selling material. Right, uh, material goods, and then you started selling uh, experiences, and from experiences there was a transition to selling this idea that you are having the authentic experience. Uh, the limit, if you push that to the limit, right, if you go to the like Manhattan ladies that are uh, so wealthy, they, they're basically trying to figure out how to signal status now, um, you actually have artificial neglectedness. So, artificial? So you, are, not artificial neglectedness, artificial scarcity. Mm. Right, so basically you only make like five purses of a specific kind uh, and the value is not in what the purse material is or even not in the authenticity <laughs> of it, but in the fact that only five people can own it in the world. Like Elon Musk created only 20,000 uh, flamethrowers. <laughs> oh yeah? Okay, <laughs> to sell so. as merchandise. Yeah. What yeah. comes after uh, authenticity? What's next? I mean, there's a few things. Musk is actually a very good marketeer of many different kinds of things, right? So, yeah. so he uses counter signaling, for instance, with like the Boring Company. Why is it called the Boring Company? Because like now we're talking about it, right? It worked. Mm. The fact that I'm mentioning it on a podcast means it's good marketing. Um, Explain counter signaling. Oh yeah, so so signaling theory is a theory in evolutionary psychology where um, not only evolutionary psychology but also ethology, because animals mm. do it as well. Uh, where you might signal a property by having some other things. So if a female is selecting a male bowerbird, uh, they're not going to select the bowerbird by his uh, individual shape or behavior. They're going to, to detect if he built a very interesting nest of super colorful things that he picked up in the region yeah. nearby, right? Or the peacock yeah, yeah. as an example? Well, the peacock's tail is a, is a, is a slightly simpler example of, mm -hmm. uh, of signaling because then, you know, the peacock doesn't have any cognitive uh, understanding of what he's signaling, but he just has that... And the, the Ferrari style. in humans. <laughs> yeah, those are costly signals. So both the peacock tail and the Ferrari are costly signaling examples mm -hmm. where you're you're demonstrating that you have so many resources that you can have blue, which is the most expensive color to produce in nature, and colorfulness, and 152, I think, is the, the ideal number of eyes for a peacock to have for maximal attractiveness. <laughs> um, yeah, and... Um, and counter-signaling? So counter-signaling is... Uh, also in birds, it's like, it was one of the best examples. So if I'm a mama bird, and I noticed that there's a predator coming nearby and, you know, my, my child bird uh, is um, hanging out in the nest. I want to pretend that I'm like weak, for instance, right? So this is like handicap. You, you can handicap signal uh, mm -hmm. so that the, you will get the attention of the predator and then you will like fly away 
uh, but only once the predator is close enough to you that they're no longer bringing attention to your kid. So that's, that's a case where the thing that you're signaling and the thing that you are are kind of inverse. Hmm. Uh, the same thing with a boring company, right? Uh -huh. like the, the idea of having a company for flamethrowers, it's not exactly the most boring thing, but you can counter signal that way. Or if you're from a family that has been wealthy for sufficiently long, it's very rare that you will be the owner of a Ferrari or that you will, you know, uh, do things that are stereotypically considered to be wealthy things. So the new rich tend to signal wealth more disproportionately, whereas old family wealth tends to cause people to be more into counter signaling. So they'll be dressed in a, mm. in a more simple manner. They will have behaviors that are uh, not easily necessarily detectable as the high class. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So let's return to the question of how did all this knowledge impact your practical day-to-day -day life? I mean, I, I think I can see more easily when there are traps set by society or set by others mm. where people tell me what I should value in a way that I don't think it will actually impact either my life or that which I ethically value in, in, in sufficient ways, right? So I think that people are highly uh, concerned and obsessed at times with things that I personally no longer value. And I, I think part of the reason why I don't value is because I understand the psychological dynamics that are behind it or the biological dynamics that are behind it. Uh, and conversely, right, I value more uh, some types of things that I wouldn't know consciously to value otherwise. So I observe landscapes more and I hang out in nature in different ways more because I know that there are detectors in my brain that want to know that there's accessible fruit nearby and mm. if the enemy mm -hmm. was coming from some direction, I could potentially curtail the enemy. Um, and in many other ways, I try to make sure that my uh, limbic system, which is the part of the brain that processes uh, some aspects of emotion, uh, and my nucleus accumbens are experiencing good states. Uh, yeah. Now I have a really interesting question regarding something what you said, which you said. So we know that different tribes clashed to an extent because they hold different values. You know, yeah. they, they have different criteria, what is good, what is acceptable, what do we want, what do we don't want. That uh, the similar thing happened on a large scale with religions. And now similar thing is happening uh, in the last 100 or so years with political ideologies. And right. the, we get um, e more and more political ideology and ideologies, not only political ones, you know, like uh, carnivorism versus veganism, men versus women and whatever. So right. we get a fragmentation of uh, the number of value systems, so an increase in the number of value systems. My right. question is, can evolutionary psychology uh, leads to the establishment of universal human values which can be used to like synchronize our value systems so that we don't clash so much. I think there's some difference between, uh, between my response to that question and what most evolutionary psychology people would say. I Give think, both. Yeah, because I, I think that they would say that yes, you can find sufficiently many universal human, uh, <coughs> hum, universal human traits many of which summarized by, I think, David Brown or Dave Brown, something like that in 1983, um, that you could just try to implement a value system that is organized around all those things that are human universals. Uh, the way I see it, however, is there are some human groups that are more individualistic, there are some groups that are more tribally affiliated, uh, there are some groups that have transcendental value. Mm. So the competition in the world, it isn't... Uh, it isn't easily subsumable into, you know, even if you knew what the origin is, the interest groups are still different, right? So um, let's take, you know, three of the biggest systems in the world are uh, the, there's an Eurasian, there's an Eurasian sort of bureaucratic, global, militarized system that is kind of the remnants of the USSR plus China and, and, and other authoritarian, authoritarian systems uh, that want to organize the world in a particular way. Uh, then you have, uh, you know, <coughs> different tribes in the USA uh, that are, uh, basically the USA is two worlds. Mm -hmm. There's a blue tribe and there's a red tribe and, and they, they aim for different things. Um, 
and the blue tribe of the USA is fairly connected to the global uh, agenda system, the international system that has more to do with nomadic populations that have evolved to be uh, you know, minorities in different areas, but they are very distributed. Um, and that's one type of value system. So you can have, you have the clashing of, of a system that evolved for social and bureaucratic reasons throughout the last century. Another system that evolved through thousands of years for evolutionary reasons. And then you have uh, Islam, which is a very particular religious transcendent system, but it's also extremely powerful in some parts of the world. Uh, and these conflicting organizations and ideologies, their constitutive structure isn't made of the same thing. Because one is a transcendental religion, one is a bureaucratic population, militarized system. Uh, one might be a mix of a religious indoctrination and a psychological way of thinking. So Christianity and individualism might be thought of as those things. Uh, and then the other is these like nomadic populations and... and powerful groups in different parts of the world that want to internationalize the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. So these agents, they're not made of the same thing. These ideas, by the way, I'm getting from uh, Olavo de Carvalho, who is a Brazilian, very, very interesting philosopher, mm -hmm. in his debate with Alexander Dugin, mm -hmm. who is a yeah, Russian intellectual. Mm -hmm. Russian? Well, so Soviet something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what's the next thing which you're going to research? What was the next big question? I mean, one of the questions that always interested me and fascinated me is what will be the most te most transformative technological changes in the history of the world, f including all the past and all the future, right? Transhumanism. And there's a good chance that artificial intelligence might be the one to, to watch for. Transhumanism might be a, a, a bit of a slower transition mm -hmm. uh, of transforming human nature into something worth living, let's say. Uh, I mean, I do, th I do think human nature is, is pretty <coughs> awesome, but I also happen to be very high on the distribution of happiness in the yeah, spectrum. Everything is awesome, guys. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I want to make sure that to the extent we can create a technological future where the world has the maximum amount of minds mm -hmm. having the best, awesomest time ever, mm -hmm. we can do that. And that's basically been my quest. And I think that artificial intelligence is the, is the path that even though it has a low probability, uh, it, it has the highest magnitude of interference uh, in the world that you can pop possibly positively do. So that's what I'm researching, artificial general intelligence. How can it interfere with uh, the problems with human morality? It will be used as a weapon, 100% artificial intelligence. It's too tempting not to do that. Well, it depends. There's two ways in which artificial intelligence could evolve. One is by, if it's possible for it to bootstrap itself into becoming a super intelligence, mm -hmm. then you only need to solve that problem once. Uh, and that's the case that I was thinking about when, when I mentioned that. If you mean like the slow evolution of different artificial intelligence systems in different countries and different companies and so on over time, yeah, then, then the problem is much more uh, tricky, I suppose, because you have to solve it in every case. And not only you have to solve it in every case, but there's a competitive drive between those different systems and groups. And the ones that don't spend resources in solving that problem might outpace the ones that do. Um, that's the kind of thing that's studied by the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford University. Um, by, there's, a, there's a fairly you know, interesting and diverse group of researchers there that's organizing um, how to think about these competitive drives and evolutionary competition within AI and so on. I hit a slightly different point. Uh, let me elaborate further. Yeah. So our modern life, given our modern current technological advance, is uh, better than the life in heaven, which was imagined by our ancestors. So modern medicine, for example, so even, the, extent, sure. even the quality of modern food, clothes, uh, we have magic. Oh, we have more than they could had uh, possibly hoped for. And yet we still had great problems, uh, a great extent of which comes from problems with human morality, you know, like uh, aggression, war, um, intertribal right. aggression is not as much of a danger as we would think aggression has been getting a very strong bad reputation yes. lately correct mostly because of yeah, it's uh, decreasing dramatically yeah, there's, a, there's an interference of the, the uh, of feminism and in trying to demasculinize the world 
which has suppressed aggression mm. and aggression in particular in young boys it's not that damaging but okay. go on <laughs> a lar large scale human conflict how can right future technology including ai help make the human condition better and awesome so in order to do that it right. must also solve the problem of uh, human uh, so tribes well, fighting with each other let us first praise the past technology that has already solved most of the game theoretic problems that have been killing humans for god knows how long for which example is once once we had uh, one or two countries that had the ability to destroy the world in each other mm -hmm. uh, you can create this game theoretical uh, constraint that we call mutually assured destruction and by having mutually assured destruction you assure that from then on most wars will be economic and cultural wars instead of being violent and aggressive can and I stop wars. worrying and stop loving the bomb? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Or, or rather he, he who presses the button first, <coughs> he who presses the button first dies second <laughs> right so yeah, once once that technology was available, that was great. And I think that we, as humanity, thought a lot about it in the 60s. So we already have some knowledge in it on how technology right. would affect our lives and uh, using it in warfare. Right. Yeah, well, one thing that has been troublesome in technology recently is that you know with the development of social media. Uh, a new kind of violence that had lain dormant or like partially dormant for most of human history has manifested much more strongly. So male violence was, uh, yeah, male violence was more strong and manifest for most of history. Mm -hmm. um, but female violence doesn't manifest as pure power and aggression. Mm -hmm. It manifests as gossip behind the back. Uh, saying reputa re reputational attacks and so on. Not in and social way. media has enabled that to flourish and multiply itself in ways that it had never hit third or done. Mm. I actually think that the cause of third wave feminism is the rise of the uh, of different yeah. internet and, and social media. Mm. So, you know, to the extent that third wave feminism is a violent <laughs> system, uh, I think it was technologically enabled by the creation of these anonymous instantaneous information transmission systems between people like in very far uh, directions why aren't you ideologically possessed high openness i mean we are discussing a pretty controversial topics regarding the current times and yet we can discuss opposite topics and play with those in our minds without getting caught into defending a point for the point's sake why are we different from a psychological point of view I think a little bit of the training in philosophy might help with that. Mm -hmm. So I've had training in philosophy and you learn to entertain different positions and you learn to articulate a position that you don't necessarily believe. Um, and also having been influenced by uh, Less Wrong, which is a rationality blog, and a group of people who are constantly trying to figure out the truth, uh, even when they're wrong, uh, helps. But just having some emotional stability and some emotional centering that doesn't depend on these identity groups, mm. uh, that's very helpful to me, right? So what I most like to get out of a discussion is that some mind changes, but I don't mind if the mind that changes is mine. Mm -hmm. Whereas most people try to get out of a discussion that the other mind changes and that's almost always the, the you know, you always want to seek the information that would demonstrate that you're wrong and most people just don't have the psychological fortitude to anticipate that that's what they, they want to do. Also, conf conformism actually pays off, right? So if you're conformist, you're more likely to find a mate mm -hmm. uh, in, in most of the natural group systems that humans had throughout evolutionary history. So it makes sense that most people should be conformists and that only if you've taken a big status hit or something like that, that you would be willing to explore uh, unusual, controversial, weird uh, ideas that diverge from your immediate group. But now that everyone is connected, like basically no one knows what to do and half the people are getting <laughs> completely ideologically possessed in one direction and half the people are getting the other way. And they and want to we, destroy each other in all, its, all means possible. Yeah, I mean, to be frank, it's not as bad as it used to be in the Cold War, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, 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 they were still trying to do that back then. You, you said that you were attacked for your ideas. 
physically? I think I, 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 I know I've been I've been attacked most most likely socially or or from a group perspective. So you know sometimes someone might try to uh, either lie or distort something that I've said to people that are getting to know me in order to preemptively have them uh, think of me with such like a negative reputation that they don't want to, you know, interface yeah, some with me. Sort of a predisposition, like some sort of a prejudice, like bef before they actually get to know you, yeah. they're getting to know you through the other person's words. Right, and yeah, basically it's it's just it a system of, everywhere. there's a system of gossip and attack, and, and this is a system, you know, like, <coughs> this is a system that's very operant in the left in general, uh, yeah. like the, 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 the current left as of, you know, 20 years ago or so, uh, but a little bit before that, it attacks, it attacks the individual instead of attacking the idea, it attacks by reputational cost or by removing the source of income uh, more often then it attacks by, you know, specifically trying to say, look, here's where the hole in your argument is, and here's why you're wrong, mm -hmm. right? Can uh, teaching basic critical thinking No, because you're, assu you're assuming that the, in the, the even though the... The capacity to be taught to think critically, and so people yeah. don't think critically. Yeah, like these people might have the capacity to think critically, mm. but it's not necessarily in their best political interest to do so. So Sololinsky, for instance, was one of the developers of, uh, I think he wrote a book called Rules for Revolutionaries or, or, or something what like that. What for revolutionaries? Rules for revolution, Revolutionaries or, or some other thing. I don't remember the name of it. But the basic idea is he suggested this idea of methodological nihilism, uh, yeah. which is as long as it causes you to get power in the end, as long as it causes the party or the system that you're fighting for to get power in the end, it doesn't matter by which methodology you, you play the game. So, to some extent, this has generated a system where, to the extent that the left and the right are sort of playing tennis to each other, the right is playing with the net on, and the, the left just puts the net Ooh. down and then plays, right? So, they, they're willing to do whatever it takes in order to acquire the, 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 the amount of power that's needed for achieving whatever political goals. So, you see that in the United States recently, and um, they really needed to get this guy out of the judicial system, and they were willing to, to uh, use a woman who didn't want to speak in public and delay the information that she gave to them uh, in order to maximize the probability that that guy wouldn't end up in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, it's not because they, you know, they didn't care about the woman and they didn't have an ethical rule that would prevent them from doing so. You know? mm -hmm. Because the goal was to... I mean, there were many goals, right? But the, the main goal was just to increase the amount of power that mm -hmm. the left and the blue tribe has in the Supreme Court of the U.S. And maybe to some extent, this behavior is uh, unconsciously motivated and they are rationalized. Well, in the majority of people, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you know, it's a uh, people are not that hard to herd. Uh, to be a shepherd of, uh, if you if you know how to poke their buttons, right? So, uh, and, With a and stick. yeah, this happens in the right and the left. This is not a this is not a this, you know like Trump might be more right wing now, but he's an extremely excellent uh, and powerful manipulator of people. Uh, Obama was a very amazing speaker who could transform the intuitions of crowds in, in minutes. And you also have uh, you know deeper. Uh, political agents who are doing that kind of thing from an economic or intellectual perspective. So you might have the academic equivalents of these famous politicians, right, who are doing that by other ways. Um, or even investors that are just switching and poking the economy in ways mm -hmm. uh, that might cause the same effects. Yeah. All right. Um, if you want to lead, you have to be an agile person. So it, you don't have to stick to some decision or some kind of mentality. You can change it just to be in charge, something like that. High in openness. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, being high in openness definitely helps. Uh, what can raise openness except psychedelics? 
I, I don't think we know anything except psychedelics <laughs> that can raise. Uh, in fact, personality, personality characteristics are fairly stable across a lifetime, mm -hmm. with the exception of openness when you take psychedelics. Yeah, openness <laughs> has some practical advantages in, from in evolutionary terms. It's an adaptation to a certain environment, right? Sure. Well, all, all, uh, the reason why the big five uh, personality characteristics or big ten mm -hmm. personality aspects our personality characteristics to begin with is because it's evolutionarily valuable to be within the entire range of the distribution. If it wasn't valuable to be in the distribution, there would be just, let's say, defects, right? There would be just problems that you mm -hmm. have. Uh, but it's not a problem to be highly neurotic because even though it might cause a lot of trouble in your social life, it will make you very good at taking care of a baby that's a very innocent and tiny thing that, you know... Or living in a dangerous environment that rapidly changes. Right, or living in an environment where you're not supposed to be trusting people or you're supposed to be yeah, switching gears very quickly and efficiently. In what environment did uh, people who score high in openness evolve in? No, but the, the, the population as a whole will get a different distribution of personalities, perhaps, but um, you definitely want to have at least a tiny bit of all personalities yeah, in most societies, right? Or rather the question was, high openness is beneficial in what situations? Well, when you have abundance of resources, you might want to test new territories, right? So mm -hmm. you, you want to have high openness on that. Um, if you think of the fitness landscape as being, <coughs> you know, a, a series of valleys and mountains, then when you are stuck in a local good, you want to have someone who is high in openness enough to find whichever way you can basically jump and find the, the globally maximally valuable resource. So high openness, high openness is one way to, to get that sort of thing. Um, and increased plasticity in general might do that. So the two plasticity related characteristics are openness and extroversion. If you're high in extroversion or if you're high in openness, in both cases, you're more likely to stumble into the solution that, you know, no one else has used for the last thousand years. <coughs> I mean, I, I think in when you play RPGs, computer games, uh, a team of five people selects five different characters, which mm -hmm. uh, have different abilities and skills, and they work together in order to win. And when I view human psychological traits, it's something like that. You're good in something, someone else is good at something else, and when we work together, we can, we can achieve much more this way. And yet, uh, this is also a source of identity which people use in order to distinguish themselves from other people and like fight again. There's a, there's a motivational speaker in the US, uh, what's his name? Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins, yeah. So Tony Robbins mentions that you know all humans have six uh, needs. I'm not going to remember all of them, but the two ones that are relevant for the issue I'll remember, uh, which is everyone has a need for certainty and a need for uncertainty, um, and those might you know seemingly be inconsistent needs, but uh, at least it seemed in his experience meeting people from many different societies and systems that everyone wants to be you know. Um, sufficiently certain of their external environment that they can act in ways that are cause predictive movements but mm -hmm. also you want to have sufficient levels of uncertainty that you don't get too bored or like you, get, you have some system that activates you so you're on the border or, between chaos and or like <laughs> the, jordan peterson if you want to translate that into peterson <laughs> vocabulary then for sure yes and uh, in the old futuristic novellas where um, the humankind achieve all the well-being. Um, a lot of time they they are bored, uh, bored and need some uncertainty in their life. And something right. happens, so this uncertainty is. Uh, and, and this is a, a an evolutionarily yeah. designed, yeah. <laughs> like the the loss of valence is an evolutionarily designed drive, right? You you want to for your environment to change, especially if it's no longer the case that you're increasing your ability to produce babies in the future or, you know, great-grandchildren or whatever. And when we talk about uncertainty, we can't main, uh, can't go without mention Nassim Taleb and... Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. <full play run. laughs> Randomness. <laughs> yeah. I'm not very familiar with that aspect of Taleb's work. I only know about antifragility, which is one of the mm. concepts that he came up with. And the Black Swan, sure. Yeah. 
Anti-fragility is the result of his uh, previous work on how we understand, um, more like how we don't understand uncertainty and randomness. Um, right. Yeah, we, we're not necessarily very good at inferring these mathematical complex constructs that are created later. Uh, yeah, but in psychology terms, it's like in our everyday life, uh, we take a lot of decisions and they're not exactly rational, but and we take them because we think they are rational and that they are about... Uh, are, we are going to achieve certain outcome with certainty, but actually it's quite the opposite. Uh, that's why bubbles are happening, like economically and even with right. even with Bitcoin and something like that. Most people are certain that it's going to rise, but the causality is lacking. Like why it happened? Right. I, I, I think we have a. We definitely have economic systems that are not, you know, organized in the same ways as the mystical environment in which we evolved. We evolved to deal with uh, yeah. nature, spirits, yeah. animals, and other humans. And then suddenly we find ourselves in a world of algorithms, blockchains, and uh, speculators, and, the global, new beasts. and global internet, you know. It's, it's, it's definitely a big mismatch between our environmental adaptation and our current world. Yeah, I have. Um, I think it's time for one last question. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I imagine that. So I read a lot of science fiction as young, and I still read some. And I always imagined a human future, human space civilization. Civilization. Mm -hmm. So the question is: Okay, we can send people to Mars, but what should we do? Some random ideas of yours to prevent us into getting starting an ideological fight on Mars. <laughs> you know, imagine that, you know, the dust the pro dust versus the anti Martian dust people, you know, <laughs> fight, you know. The dust is natural. We shouldn't interfere. Well I guess in that particular case evolutionary psychology is sort of on our side, right? Because mm -hmm. when the when scarcity kicks in, we sort of know what to do, you know. We 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 def we default to hierarchies of competence mm -hmm. uh, with very efficient and accurate uh, and fast. Um, you know, we, we we do those things fairly fast uh, because I I mean it it's really easy to get humans to elect and organize around the leader. Mm -hmm. by, by, by noticing a meteor or a volcano or something like that, right? Very, it's Those a, it's a movies, fairly quick, you know. It's a, yeah, it's a, fair, it's a fairly quick system <laughs> that, 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 that will happen there. And these ideological battles that you see, they're in great part, you know, because different people evolved in different systems, different countries have different interests and so on. Uh, and you're not going to get that in a small society for a really, really long time. So, for instance, it wasn't necessary to evolve a monotheistic god until societies were about, what, a few million people, mm. people wide? Uh, and likewise, for as long as the Mars population is small, I wouldn't predict there to be some sort of ideological clashes between them, uh, because small societies can solve conflicts by far more amenable and biologically natural ways, than the hyper complex legal systems that we've evolved now, the political chaos that we've evolved now, memes through the internet, and uh, you know, if if you're not even at the stage at which you need a religion and a god in order to organize a society, that is, if you have a small tribe, um, you're not going to get ideological conflict anytime soon. That's my guess. Okay. Let's just say we're good at surviving. We're very good at surviving in small groups. <laughs> okay. Okay. Nice for it. So thank you. It, it was a pleasure. Thank you for coming to Varna. So, <laughs> so we like chatted once or twice and uh, you decided to come here and it was a great pleasure. Really, sincerely. It was a, it was a pleasure to be here and thank you guys for uh, an interesting discussion. Okay, music and credits rolling. Okay, <laughs>